Uh, our very own John Sharsmith is going to give us a discussion about Jackson Lake Dam, the local history and geology. I will tell you he's uh, nervous as a cat over here, so try not to stump him. <laughs> but uh, he's done a lot of wandering around and he lives out in Moran and he's really had a chance to look at it and put it together and we thank you, John. So go ahead. Thanks, John. If I fade away, Steve, wave your arm. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, uh, the Master Road Jackson Lake Dam in Grand Teton National Park. You're fading Park. away. What? You're fading away. Am I fading away? All right, I'll show you. Uh, it lies in a basin gouged more than 600 feet deep by glaciers flowing from the neighborhood Teton Range to the west and the Yellowstone Plateau to the north. Jackson Lake was a natural impoundment created by a moraine deposit when the Pinedale Stage Valley Glacier retreated. The moraine served as a barrier that diverted the Snake River from Bearpaw Bay uh, in the northeast and forced it into its present pattern, flo pattern flowing in a loop around the east side of Signal Mountain. The breaching of the first Jackson Lake Dam on July 5th, 1910 was probably uh, was the probable with the probable avulsion of the snake of, of the Oxbow Lake may be one of the most significant flood events on the Snake River in recorded history of Jackson Hole. The scarcity of photographs and oral and written documentation of early events in the valley makes description of the early 19th century human history in Jackson Hole difficult. What photographs are available? courtesy of the Jackson Hole Historical Society and Museum and the Bureau of Reclamation in Hayburn, Idaho. And if you hey, John, do try to speak up. We don't okay. have a mic in here. And, was, or, or you guys, if you finish eating, just move your chairs yeah, on up forward. here. The photo on the left is not posed. It documents the extreme difficulty of surveying the Idaho-Washington state line along the crest of the Bitterroot Mountains, first accomplished in 1873 and retraced in 1908. The arid, largely sagebrush landscape of the upper, upper Snake River Valley got little more than 10 inches of annual rainfall. However, the fertile silt and sandy loam soils were perfect for farming. And the early farmers quickly realized that with adequate water, the area could be highly productive. In the years prior to 1900, development of an irrigated farming economy required the construction of upstream water stir facilities. And plans were made to build dams, irrigation ditches, canals, and reservoirs. Preliminary surveys made by the US Geologic Survey in 1889 and 1890 field seasons, and by the Reclamation Service in 1902, assessed the storage possibilities of Jackson, Two Ocean, Emma Matilda, and Jenny Lakes, and Shoshone Lake in Yosemite Yellowstone <laughs> National Park, all tributary to the South Fork of the Snake River. Water storage projects began, began in 1906 with the construction of the Minidoka Dam near Burley, Idaho. As part of that project, construction of Jackson Lake Dam was authorized in April 1904 by the Secretary of Interior. Under a cooperative agreement with the farmers, the Bureau of Reclamation provided expertise and managed construction, while the farmers would pay back the costs within 10 years. The standard of allowance, allowance for water for irrigation purposes is one acre foot per 70 acres. Homesteading of natural of, of Jackson Hole was delayed relative to other areas of the West by the mountainous terrain, long cold winters, and the difficulty of transportation. Thus, homesteaders first reached Jackson Hole in the 1880s well after much of the West was settled. Charles and Maria Allen 
were some of the original homesteaders in the area. They settled in 1896 on Oxbow Bend in the northern portion of the valley with only a few neighbors before 1900. Excuse me, what was the Maria, last name? What was the last name, John? Of that? Allen. A-L-L-E-N, not A-N. Thank you. Uh, Maria operated the first post office on their ranch in 1902. Maria named it Moran after Mount Moran, which carries the name of Thomas Moran, the prominent landscape artist of the American West who participated in the 1872 Hayden's survey of Yellowstone Park. The Allens operated the Elkhorn Hotel for several years before, the selling, before selling the price to Ben Sheffield in 1907. The Allens catered to overnight travelers coming from the south entrance of Yellowstone. The majority of Yellowstone's visitors accessed the park through the north and west entrances, but enough visitors used the south entrance to justify the $15,000 approved by Congress to construct a road from, from Old Faithful in the Upper Geyser Basin to Yellowstone's south entrance. With the event of the military road, it was much easier for tourist traffic to travel south out of Yellowstone to see the Tetons. The Allens kept a small parcel, a small three-acre parcel of land on a hill overlooking Oxbow Bend and out towards Jackson Lake. In 1904, Charles and Maria's son Andrew was thrown from his horse and died from his injuries. The family established a small cemetery on a hill within their homestead uh, to bury Andrew. And less than a decade later, in 1913, the Allen family experienced another tragedy when their son Neil fell from his horse and drowned in the Snake River. Neil was buried next to Andrew, and their two graves stand over 32 others in what became known as the Allen Cemetery. Today, nearly all of the burials are related to Charles and Maria. Close friends and neighbors also were allowed plots. Where's that cemetery? Excuse me? Where is that cemetery? Where is that cemetery? It's up near Jackson Lake Lodge. Near the lodge. Uh, I'll tell you later how to get there if you wish. Uh, Homesteading in Jackson Hole was a careful balance of surviving the harsh winters short growing season and violent, unexpected weather patterns. Droughts, midsummer hailstorms, and even the wildlife posed serious threats to the livelihoods of the homesteaders who tried to raise cattle or hay. For many in Jackson Hole, 160 acres was simply not enough land to raise both cattle and the amount of hay needed to keep livestock and horses through the winter. Homesteaders who persevered took great pride in their ranching operations, knowing they were solely responsible for their success. Some creative ways to supplement their income was taking jobs with the Forest Service or the Reclamation Service in correct constructing Jackson Lake Dam. Women ran the local post office or taught at the small community schools to make ends meet. Many ranchers found a new source of income in the increasing number of tourists traveling through the valley to see Yellowstone National Park. By often a bed and food to the weary travelers, the ranchers began to rely less on cattle and hay operations. Cap and Clara Smith opened and ran a roadhouse as traffic coming down the military road from Yellowstone increased in 1890 to 19, 1892. In 1903, Ben Sheffield purchased the Smith and Lovell properties with the intention of opening a hunting lodge. The area was already becoming a tourist destination. Many believed it was Frank Lovell who was responsible for building the toll bridge that allowed access into Moran over the dam site. Other sources claim it was Ben Sheffield's doing. What was the second part of that? Claire claimed what? Claimed Ben Sheffield did it. it was oh, uh, others claim it was Ben Sheffield's doing that built the uh, toll bridge. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> what was the level? Wrong way, Gold Farm. Here. What was the level man's name? Excuse me. What was the other guy's name? Second? It never was mentioned. Level. Oh, it didn't mention his name. Yeah. 
Clarkville, who had built the iconic barn on Roman, Mormon Row, said of his homestead near, near Moran, when we were little kids and lived in those old log houses, the wind howled right through those cracks. It blew so hard that our friends would, our folks would have to keep an eye out to bring us back across the room to where we had been playing. The earliest artificial impoundment on Jackson Lake was probably built in 1905 of brush and mud by Valley homesteaders for local irrigation. That dam was washed out by high water, was rebuilt by the Bureau of Reclamation in 1907, was washed out again in 1910, and rebuilt in 1911, costing $1.1 million. At that time, Jackson Lake Dam was the fifth largest in the world. At that time, few people thought about earthquakes, even though the dam lay in a seismic zone. Seventy years later, when, the, when geologic analysis revealed that the north embankment of the dam was constructed on a 635-foot depth of sedimentary muck with the load-bearing strength of jello, the dam was rebuilt one more time. UREC engineers in 1911 had no alternative but to rebuild Jackson Lake Dam on the site of the previous dams. Idaho farmers owned the water and UREC was contractually obligated to supply it. Despite the serious geotechnical instability of the substrate, the three temporary Jackson Lake Dams were built at the low, low point in the drainage. The choice was between rebuilding the dam at the lake outlet or none at all. To have built the dam at the south end of Bear Paw Bay, which was the original outlet of Jackson Lake, would have required the raising of levers uh, to 68 feet. So that would be quite difficult. John, where exactly is that Bear Paw? Bear Paw Lake is south of uh, Jackson Lake, kind of nestled between Spalding Bay and Browns Cove. Does that? Explain. Okay. It's a far south of, of uh, Jackson Lake, and Bear Paw Lake feeds into Lee Lake, and then into Jenny Lake and down Lake Creek. Okay. Thank you. It became apparent to Reclamation that continuing development of irrigation in the Upper Snake River Valley required more water storage under the Minidoka project. Reclamation considered Jackson Lake as the only site capable of storing the required 216,000 acre feet of water. So plans were made for a temporary timber dam to raise the surface of the lake 10 feet, which would increase Jackson Lake's capacity to 350,000 acre feet. You know what an acre foot of water is? It's an acre of land with one foot of water. Um. It was estimated that a 200-foot-long steel frame dam on Jackson Lake was the most effective means of water storage. A metal superstructure 15 feet high supported 25 gate, open, gate openings, each 9 feet wide, capable of, dis, capable of discharging 2,000 cubic feet per second was planned. 14 gates at the center 66 feet of the dam were designed to operate under normal conditions other gates could be opened under periods of ab when abnormally high discharge was desired. Accordingly, a, a recon <laughs> reconnaissance survey of a wagon road from Ashton to the dam site, surveys and borings at the Pacific Creek confluence, and a survey of the topography of the natural Jackson Lake were made. But compaction tests near the Pacific Creek confluence indicated that gravel was too loose and soil too porous to support the weight of a permanent dam. So the dam was sited near the outlet of the natural Jackson Lake. Shoshone Lake in Yellowstone National Park was also considered as a feasible site for economic water storage, though the cost per acre foot of storage was greater than at Jackson Lake. The cost of storage at Two Ocean, Emma Matilda, and Jenny Lakes was higher still while capacities were considerably lower. Fortunately, the 260,000 acre feet of annual storage required by the Minidoka project could be provided by Jackson Lake, so no additional dam sites were considered. 
We should recognize that development for water storage in many of the lakes drained by the South Fork of the Snake River was a near miss. Instead of pristine natural lakes, we might now see only drawdown reservoirs. A temporary dam of rock-filled log cribs, probably begun in 1906, was located at the outlet of Jackson Lake to impound 147,000 acre feet of water storage. This included 2.4 feet of substorage developed by lowering the natural lake spillway, followed by dredging of the downstream river channel. In the hundred something went wrong here, wait. Hmm. Okay, got it. Uh, a series of log cribs totaling 185 feet in length was built. No mention of excavation of the, of the foundation to bedrock was found in the literature. The middle section of the cribbing was built first, floated into place, and sunk in 13 feet of water by filling it with rock. Much of the substrate at the dam site was too fine for filling the cribs, so a quarry was opened near the center of the north side of nearby Signal Mountain. In the 80 to 110 years since the quarry was operated, it has been extensively regrown by vegetation, and I almost didn't find it. It was really hidden. Now there's nothing left but a few rusted cans, shreds of cable, and curved strips of iron once fitted to a rock sled. The wagon road ends above and does not connect with the quarry. My guess is that a crane was used to lift blocks of the Huckleberry Tuff up to the roadhead. Imagine what it was like in 1910 to 14 to drive a wagon behind a team of four or six snorting and puffing up the steep winding road to the quarry, and then to return with a several ton load of rock, brake squealing, stomp on the lever hard, iron wheels, rims, grinding and scraping, and then let it let up and run through the levels. John, about how far away from the dam was that quarry? I hiked up there. Uh, that's how I got these photos. I would estimate two to two and a half miles. Wow. It's a reasonably gentle pull. But yeah. uh, suddenly the road ended. I didn't know where the quarry was, and so I wandered way up the hill. <laughs> didn't find it. Was so, that uh, cribbing, uh, the photo of the cribbing, was that the original <coughs> 1907? No, uh, that I found on the internet, but it was a good substitute. There were very few photographs made of, uh, of, the, of the dam at that point in construction. Later, yes, but uh, the early ones are just really scarce. Does that old cribbing still exist? Couldn't hear you? Does that old cribbing still exist? No, oh well, I'll explain. Oh, okay. <laughs> who, who was it that constructed it? Was the Forest Service? Um, Bureau of Reclamation. So the, the Bureau of Rec did the, the cribbing dam? They built the cribbing, yes. Interesting. And that was just temporary. Ah. Uh, so how did the Idaho farmers end up owning this if the government kept building the dam? Right. Uh, it's, I'll get to that later, it's geology. Thank you. Not water law. <laughs> okay, construction of the temporary dam began in July of 1905. Progress on the dam was necessarily influenced by the short season of agreeable working weather, compounded by the remote location and limited labor supply. During the first construction season, excavation of the footings of the dam was done by team pulled scrapers, and carpenters built the cribs used to anchor the 185 foot long dam. When the crib foundation was completed and partially filled with rock, and 500 feet of the south embankment was partially completed, work on the dam was suspended for the season on December 24, 1905. Work was resumed in early May of 1906, filling the cribs and abutments with rock, and construction of the superstructure was completed, though difficulties with the coffer dam delayed progress in September and again in October, and the job was closed down for the season in mid-November. Okay, here's an example of the log crib dam with cro in cross-section with the front wall of logs removed for clarity. And I assume that the 
dimensions are approximate. Uh, this didn't come from Jackson Lake Dam. Earth-filled embankments flanked the crib dam. The embankment on the south side of the dam was only a few feet long, while to the north of the dam, the embankment extended nearly 1,500 feet. A double row of sheet piling was placed on the upstream side of the embankment as protection from erosion by wave action. The floodgates were first lowered into the dam in September of 1908, and that season, 155,000 acre feet of water was delivered to the Idaho farmers. Lodgepole pine is poorly resistant to rot, particularly in the presence of water. Considerable damage to the crib foundation of the dam was discovered in late 1909, and 3,300 cubic rock, yards of rock was placed on the downstream toe of the structure, but it did little good. Now, notice the gap in the dam. It went away. Okay. Not right, not right, not right. Go on. There. Okay. What is that? It's a big wave. The, excuse me? It's a big wave. Is that yes. a breach in the dam? Well, the, the, uh, the dam released a huge amount of water. This abrupt increase in discharge in bulk volume, well, there's something wrong here. What is missing? Okay. On July 5th, 1910, approximately 10 days before the beginning of the Idaho irrigation season, a level of Jackson Lake behind the temporary log dam was 11 feet above the natural shore of the lake. The middle third of the superstructure separated from the crib work, releasing 194,000 acre feet of impounded water in a flood estimated at between 10 and 12,000 second feet, and a 10, full of 10 foot wall of water surged down the Snake River Channel. This abrupt increase in discharge and bulk volume, the low-lying, easily erodible, narrow septum between the limbs of the oxbow, and the presence of a cutoff in the, the absence of a cutoff in the 1899 topographic map, all suggest the probability that the oxbow lake was avulsed at that date. This flood may, have, may be the most significant flood event on the Snake River in historic times. Warning of the 10,000 second foot flood was spread downstream, but little damage was reported. In a letter, Harvey Coffin stated, on the morning the dam broke, we heard a big crash, ran to the door, and saw 75 feet of the dam go. In 1910, the population of the entire valley was only 810 people, most of whom settled at the south end of the valley. The population of Moran was even smaller, so the oral and periodical record contains minimal reference to the event. Where's the bridge? Could you show us on the map where the bridge is? Excuse me? Could you show us on that map where the... Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the Oxbow is a complex of low elevation clustered multiple meandering main stem, main stem channels, which may be abandoned or cut off, including islands, sloughs, marshes, and willow flats. This lush wetland is prime habitat for otters, muskrat, beaver, bald eagles, trout, herons, and other waterfowl. The, the avulsion lies south of the, around, of the rounded island at the center of the map. So uh, here's the, here it comes upstream, and it originally flowed through the, the oxbow, but it cut through right here, and uh, now uh, flows directly down here. So it, it left the oxbow nearly uh, without any current through it. And presently, uh, water flowing into the oxbow uh, carries sediment, and as, it, as that current meets uh, sill water, it drops that sediment. So uh, the uh, uh, entry to the oxbow is tilting in quite rapidly but still the water is refreshed by, by some movement. 
John, where, I'm sorry, I can't see. Where's the dam? What's that? Way to the left. Oh, the dam is way up here in the picture. Okay. About a mile and a half upstream. Yeah. Now, I see there there's a Cattleman Bridge. Mm -hmm. Is that the road that came down to where the bridge used to be? Used to be, yes. And Cattleman's Bridge was built by the ranchers here in the valley so they could trail their cattle from Jackson uh, up and around uh, and, then, and then cross the Snake River to graze their cattle in the potholes area, which was very lush and, and had good water. But it's all rotted away now. Yeah. Several local bridges were damaged, but the wave of high water had dissipated by the time it emerged from the Snake River Canyon. Careful manipulation of the water in the equalizing reservoir at Minidoka Diversion Dam prevented any serious damage to the canals and crops. Barker Ewing float guide Al Claggy, who hadn't heard of the evulsion of the Oxbow, suggested that based on comparison with the 1899 topo with later maps, there was a major channel change about a half a mile above the bump stump. The 1899 map shows the channel hugging the right or west bank. Now the channel makes a sharp bend south, perhaps creating the bump stump. So there are two potential evulsions of In 1896, only three options for crossing the Snake River to reach the town of Jackson from Teton Pass were available. The Jackson-Wilson Bridge uh, and the Meaners Ferry and Conrad's Ferry, that's three, and later Sheffield's Toll Bridge in Moran. Meaners Ferry was thus the only practical route and travelers and locals were forced to divert 20 miles north to the ferry crossing and then return 20 miles south. Is that because the bridge was washed out? Excuse me? Is that because the Wilson Bridge was washed out? Ah, uh, yes. It was washed out a little later and returned, and, but uh, repair was still made several years. So essentially, Meters Ferry carried all, the, carried all the traffic. No damage to Meters Ferry was reported, only, quote, a huge uprooted, uprooted tree swept against the ferry with force, breaking the ropes, and the ferry was swept downstream, taking Bill with it. After a quick drip, the, bit, the ferry grounded on a submerged gravel bar. This report does not specify whether the damage was due to natural spring, spring flooding or the flood following breaching of the log crib dam. Can you speak up a little bit? Can you please speak up a little? Oh, sure. Thank Sorry. You. Thank you. So let's talk about the very dry subject of water rights for a moment. Generally speaking, the, inner, the eastern half of the United States receives ample precipitation, leading to the adoption of riparian doctrine. The user could take water from the river, use what he needed, and then return the remainder to the river. On the other hand, west of the Missouri River, inadequate rain and snow falls to supply the needs of farmers, leading to a shortage of water. So appropriation doctrine was developed, whereby the first to use water from either a surface or subterranean source established the right to use that amount of water in perpetuity. In legal jargon, priori priority of appropriation for beneficial uses shall give the better right or first in right, first in use, first in right. A water right is authorization to use water in a prescribed manner, not to own the water itself. Without diversion and beneficial use, there is no water right. Water rights authorize the use of public water by private individuals and organizations. There are real property rights, similar to property rights in land. Normally, water rights are linked to the land. So the transfer and sale of land is accompanied 
by that quantity of water to which the owner has the right. The water in Jackson Lake, due to laws in the Wyoming Constitution and compacts created in the 1950s, belongs to Idaho farmers. They pay the U.S. Treasury an estimated amount every year, a number that includes reconstruction costs, operations, and maintenance, minus any credit from water not used the previous year. Under the Carry Act, also known as the Desert Land Act of 1894, the federal government could donate up to one million acres of land to the designated desert land states, provided that state would promote irrigation, settlement, and cultivation of those lands. Jackson Lake Reservoir represents lands to be irrigated, to be irrigated by reclamation service projects. To this day, the water rights to Jackson Lake remain attached to the farmlands in Idaho. Now, John? Yes. Do they have the rights to all the water in Jackson Lake, or do they have rights to the water just that the dam raised? They have rights to 98% of the water in Jackson Lake. Wow. wow. So, did they get these rights because, as you say, they were the pers persons to use That's it? That's right. Well, yes. And this is the problem. Uh, the very first Jackson Lake Dam was built of, dr of brush and mud by local farmers for their own irrigation. Mm -hmm. Then the Bureau of Rec came in and took over the, the uh, construction of even the temporary dam, and the Idaho farmers got all the water. Wow. So it's, yeah, Jackson Hole does not receive any water from uh, Jackson Lake Dam, except as local abstractions uh, occur along the riverbank. But the <clears throat> Idaho farmers did pay initially, right? Oh, yes, they paid initially. They paid for the dam and its maintenance, uh, at least somewhat. They were the original beavers. <laughs> okay. In 1909 and 10, plans were for the permanent Jackson Lake Dam were outlined. The design of the proposed dam was determined by the broad, low willow flat to the north. Signs are all here. I'm not moving. What's wrong? Help, help. Nope. No, don't touch don't, the screen. Don't, the screen. don't, don't screen. panic. Don't panic. <laughs> John, <laughs> uh, my mouse won't. Okay. Uh, thank you. I hope. That's the last time I have to holler for help, but I will do it again if necessary. Uh, design of the proposed dam was determined by the broad, low willow flat to the north, the gravel substrate, and the expected maximum discharge of 10,000 cubic feet per second. The design of the permanent dam required a masonry found foundation and abutments flanked by earthen embankments to impound 550,000 250 acre feet of water at an estimated cost of 21 cents per acre foot. The sheer scale of the 1910 construction project posed logistical challenges as well as engineering problems. Frank Crow recognized the need to improve the crude dragon road between Ashton and Moran before starting construction. The route along the present Ashton Flag Ranch Road also called the Grassy Lake Road or the Reclamation Road, was approximately 48 miles with only 2,241 feet of elevation gain, and the 102-mile route over Teton Pass required 3,172 feet of elevation gain. So the cost of building the shorter route from the railhead to Ashton, from in Ashton to the dam site, was more than compensated by the saving of 62 miles and the difference of uh, 931 feet. The Grassy Lake Road was improved by a crew of 50 to 60 men and 16 to 20 teams all around, at, around 1911. For the next 17 years, this road served as an important supply corridor to the north end of the valley. This was all done without any machine mechanized machinery. Jackson Lake Dam was the first major construction project in northwestern Wyoming, as Buffalo Bill Dam 
west of Cody was not completed until 1910. In anticipation of increased freight revenues, the Union Pacific Railroad rails were extended to Ashton, Idaho, and from there, three get this. This is a big number: 300,000 tons of equip of cement, nails, steel, hay, grain, food, and clothing were hauled by horse-drawn wagons to the dam site. 300,000 tons. Do you know how much a wagon can carry? Excuse me? Do you know how much weight one of those, yes. say, a six-horse wagon next can slide. carry? <laughs> or almost next slide. Comparison of the 1899 and 2007 topographic maps of Jackson Lake, indicating the increased post-dam water surface. The ex... The ex The extensive wetlands surrounding the inlet at the north end and to the east of the natural Jackson Lake were drowned by rising the water level 14.6 feet and the increase in, in area of the lake from 17,700 acres to 25,540 acres. When construction on Jackson Lake Dam was finished in 1916, the lake was extended six miles north, northward and its surface level was raised by about 30 feet. Historic trapper campsites and homesteaders, uh, homesteads, Native American sites, and at least one sulfur hot spring were submerged. Here's an aerial photo and topographic map view of Willow Flats. Note the disordered drainage of the wetlands on the 1899 topo map to the left and on the 2000 map, uh, to photo, aerial photo to the right, uh, and you see the north wing of the dam with sewage disposal ponds that's, that service Jackson Lake Lodge. Here is the levee, and the sewage disposal plants are probably over here. What date was that second one? Excuse me? What date was this aerial map? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, original map was 1899, the topo map on the left, and the uh, aerial photo, it was taken in 1907, or excuse me, 2009, 2009. <coughs> there are numerous, sometimes conflicting increases in the literature relating to the height of the dam and storage capacity with each, each iteration of dam construction. It's as if the engineer said, well, we are planning for this dimension, as long as we're building the dam, let's go this much bigger. <laughs> the Snake River Channel was dredged during and subsequent to construction of the first permanent dam in 1914 to 1916 to increase the drawdown of the reservoir. Jim Brayman, superintendent of Jackson Lake Dam, 1938 to 1974, noted that dredging extended from the base of the dam at the old Moran town site to the Kimball place where Noble Gregory was, a, was caretaker. Raymond also said he had disposed of the dredge and mentioned old pilings along the river. I asked Jim what happened on July 5, 1910 when the loud crib dam failed. Jim said nothing major, there was nothing around. There was no development in Wilson and the flood wouldn't have been noticed anyway because the seasonal runoff was high. Jim said, it probably made sense that the cutoff occurred when the dam blew out. Based on my observation of the unsightly spoil piles formed by dredging, I suggested to Grand Teton Park that rehabilitation in 100 years would require the same effort as immediately, but with the gain of sooner recovery. Here's the town of Moran with Ben Sheffield's toll bridge, one of just three crossings over the dangerous, twisting Snake River that bisected the valley. Sheffield had certainly picked a fortuitous site as the Jackson Lake Dam construction projects here, here we go, uh, brought a lot of cash and workers into town. Construction also began nearby on the military camp for the reclamation service turning the town of Moran into a bustling hub of activity. 
Teton Lodge was a central location for many tourists traveling through Jackson Hole. In the early years, Sheffield catered to wealthy hunters looking for guided trips into the Jackson Hole wilderness. As his Teton Lodge continued to grow and he added more cabins, the business quickly grew, from, uh, grew to accommodate overnight tourists arriving from Yellowstone. Here is Teton Lodge during Reconstruction after the disastrous fire of 1910, a major setback for Sheffield's growing business, destroying the dining halls, kitchen, post office, and his private living quarters. Now, was that actually at Mer the, the Moran town site? Yes, and it's, of course it's, well, yeah. some of the buildings were moved up to Jackson Lake Lodge in the early days, and of course they've all been replaced now. Right. But, Many of those buildings had a longer history than, than right. just in, in Moran, or in by the dam. But the town site isn't where the post office and uh, fire station are now, was it? It must have been further no. west. Oh, yeah. Pardon me? The town site couldn't really have been where... Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, the, the original oh. dam, the original location of, of Moran was at the dam site. That was the company town. And now... It's moved to what we would call Moran is probably the post office. Yeah, it's moved. Yeah. yeah. I believe uh, Coulter Bay is the location of some of those cabins. And Could be, sure. Triangle X said they got some. <laughs> I think everybody did. Yeah. Dam construction over the winter of 1910 and 11 was a significant accomplishment given the time frame, logistical problems, and severe weather. Frank Crow, a prominent reclamation service engineer, directed the reconstruction in 1910, while Frank Banks, who would later supervise the construction of Grand Coulee Dam, oversaw the remainder of work from 1913 to 16. Banks was described as round-faced, bespectacled, and soft-spoken. Banks exhibited, exhibited the precision of an engineer and the authority of a good administrator. He was calm and with an even disposition and had a knack for winning the goodwill and active cooperation of those around him. Work on the earthen embankments and backfilling was begun again in June of 1908, and by early by late July the gates were closed to permit storage of 150,000, 155,000 acre feet in preparation for irrigation in August. In 1915, the completed dam cost $30,000, with construction of the crib dam and abutments costing $25,000 and the right-of-way $3,000, uh, they were the most expensive uh, uh, costs in, in building the dam at less than 1000 feet, $1,000 per each. Hey, uh, John, go back a second. There's a question about where this view is taken from. You basically are uh, on the Signal Mountain side looking through the dam to where Jackson Lake Lodge is up on that rise, kind of up on the hill. You're looking behind. almost due north. Yeah, you know that parking lot as you cross the dam that's to your right as you go right. across the dam? It's it's somewhere up in that area. Yeah. So you're looking at the upstream side of yeah, the dam? Yeah, the upstream side of the dam. Here's locomotive number one and the cars used for Jackson Lake Dam construction from 1914 to 16. Regarding the other end of the operation spectrum, floods, the Burek releases water to maintain enough reservoir space to catch high water and some accommodation may be, po may be possible for other uses. This water does not e escape the irrigation net but is simply caught behind the next dam downstream. Jackson Lake Dam was fully appropriated for irrigation and no mitigation for wildlife habitat was allowed. The reservoir flooded 12,750 acres of 
of what may have been the most magnificent meadow and cottonwood forest in the Rocky Mountains, home to elk, eagles, grizzly bear, and otter by the hundreds. Nobody remembers the river that predated Jackson Lake Dam. Nobody knows the full effects and costs of the Snake River dams. The pre-dammed river is forgotten. The 69-mile section between Jackson Lake Dam and Palisades Dam has no rival in North America, combining wildlife and mountain scenery. The riparian corridor may have no equal for wildlife in the Rockies. Veteran river guide Vern Huser said, with the Yellowstone rivers being off limits to boating, the snake in Grand Teton Park is the best wildlife river this side of Alaska. If proposed today instead of 1910, Jackson Lake Dam would surely not be built at the base of the Tetons. This zip line, zip line shovel uh, carried gravel to the dam, but also was used in 1915 to quarry aggregate from the oxbow, as suggested by the presence of several anomalously deep holes in the bed of the river. Uh, in the Oxbow, as reported by Jim Brayman, the <coughs> superintendent of the, of the dam. The dam was the first major development project, pro public or private, in the valley, and as such, boosted the early, early economy significantly. The reclamation service employed numerous residents, but more, res more labor was required than, than the valley could provide, so the reclamation service brought in additional workers. Others contracted to haul freight, shipping virtually all supplies for the project over the Ashton Moran Road. One lucky homesteader, owner of the Elk Ranch, received a windfall when he secured the contract to supply beef in 1914 to the, to the dam workers. Ben Sheffield did not especially approve of the dam, but certainly benefited financially from the workers' patronage of his store, restaurant, and guest accommodations in Moran. Frank Crow assured that three roadhouses were built along the Reclamation Road to serve the farmers as they traveled through 48 miles of unsettled country. Each roadhouse complex consisted of a dwelling for the resident operator and a bunkhouse and stable for transient teamsters and their horses. The new, a new concrete section, 222 feet long and 78 feet high, was superimposed over the old concrete dam and extended 80 feet south. This raised the crest of the dam to its present 6,780 foot elevation and increased the reservoir capacity to 847,000 acre feet. The dam now holds enough water to irrigate 1.2 million acres of Idaho farmland but none was ever used for irrigation in Jackson Hole. Dr. E.C. Steele opened the, a saloon around 1911 near Jackson Lake Dam construction, but was careful to abide by federal law that a drinking establishment had to be at least a mile from a government project. So Steele, Steele used a team of horses and a white-topped buggy to shuttle customers between the dam site and his saloon several times a day and night. But he abandoned oops, but he abandoned the saloon by the next year after work slowed on the dam. Construction of the dam required six large boilers, 22 feet long, and weighing eight tons apiece. By this time, the Union Pacific Railroad had extended its lines to Victor, Idaho, just 35 miles from the dam site, thus avoiding freighting over the tortuous Ashton Moran Road. The Teton Pass route at elevation 8,400 feet featured a 19% grade in places. However, Teamsters were able to slide the boilers over the snow. When the lower concrete structure of Jackson Lake Dam was completed, the coffer dam, which held back the water, was removed by blasting. Concrete gravity dams generate their stability primarily by their inherent weight that works to counteract the lateral force of the impounded water. Secondly, the keyway serves to anchor the dam uh, in case of a seismic event. Hey John, do you have any idea what those big boilers were used for? Well, they were used for heating water to make concrete. 
Oh, okay. See, in the winter, they didn't have liquid water. Yeah. Uh, and the steam from the steam or hot water from the boilers was used also to keep the concrete from freezing. Yeah. Because it has to be kept above freezing, otherwise it just falls apart. Right. <laughs> and they didn't want that. Various skills were required of, of workers on the concrete tracks in Lake Dam. The pair on the left, who came from Central and Eastern Europe, were called Bohunks, whose job as powder monkeys was to fill holes drilled in rock with, with blasting powder. Grand Teton National Park was established in 1929 and excluded Jackson Lake. The lake was incorporated into Jackson Hole National Monument when it was proclaimed by President Franklin Roosevelt under the Antiquities Act and became part of Grand Teton, Grand Teton National Park in 1950 when the park was expanded to encompass the National Monument lands. Construction on the new dam began in 1911 and continued until 1916. That dam was reinforced in 1986 to 89 in order to meet new requirements for earthquakes to raise the water level of Jackson Lake by 17 feet and to increase its surface, surface area from 17,100 to 25,540 acres. Jackson Lake Reservoir stores water almost entirely for Idaho's huge Minidoka project and virtually nothing was done uh, for Wyoming except to enlarge Jackson Lake. I'm sorry, John, I'm confused. When was it expanded? Was it in 83 or was it much earlier? Excuse me? When was it expanded by that uh, to 25,000 acres? You sorry, right. um, I'm confused. After the first concrete dam was built. Oh, way back in 1960. Yeah, in 1910 yeah, to 16. Yeah, okay. yeah the, the work he was talking about they did in the 80s was all on the earthen part. And they did a couple of things. One, they, they drilled big holes down and filled those with a slurry of, of mud and cement in these kind of like caissons. And then the, in between those, I happened to come through here on vacation and, and when they were doing this, they had about four big cranes out there and they would lift these huge weights up and then just drop them to try to compress the dirt between where those caissons were put down into it. Because the issue on the earthen side is the possibility of liquefaction of the sediment underneath it. So what is uh, the, what at that time, I was working at Jackson Lake Lodge, and I could feel the impact, the vibrations of those weights falling on the dam at Jackson Lake Lodge. Yeah. So what is the supposed earthquake um, level which will breach that now? Uh, it's, depending on who you're talking to. <laughs> the Bureau of Reclamation says that the dam will be fine uh, for a 7, 7, 1, 7, 5. If you go to uh, Dr. Ralph Archuleto, who is an expert in liquefaction out of the University of California, Santa Barbara, who studied it extensively for them, and I had discussions since I went to Santa Barbara too with him, about his, the results that he had, uh, basically his concern, if we have a major earthquake, uh, there's a good chance that the Earth's inside will give way mm -hmm. somewhere. What's major? Uh, above seven, between seven and seven and a half. Well, that's the same. Right. And what the Bureau of Rec and their reports, uh, most of which now have been removed, so you can't get to them after 9-11, and all of Ralph's work has gone away by 9-11. They just literally confiscated those for fear of terrorists taking out the dams in the country. But in their report, uh, the, the Bureau of Rec says that if we have a 7.5 level earthquake, the concrete portion of the dam will shake at a, with a magnitude 8 level of shaking for about 90 seconds. The earthen side of the dam will shake at a magnitude nine level of shaking for over three minutes. Mm -hmm. Due to the sediment that's underneath it, this thing will be like a big jello bowl, just right. back and forth. And, and 
the area I worry about is where those two pieces meet. If something's going to fail when you got two different frequencies at the same point, you've got a point of failure. So I tell people, you know, you don't need to worry about the volcano, but if we have a really strong earthquake and all the dishes and the pictures are off the wall and on the floor, don't pick them up first. <laughs> Go outside and try to figure out what's going on at the dam. Get to high ground. Get to high ground. Yes. Say what? Jackson doesn't have to worry about that. It's Wilson. Yeah, Wilson would, <laughs> Wilson would be under 17 feet of water. And, but it'll take quite and, a while. But it'll take over 12 hours to get there. So you'll have plenty of time but to get there. But somehow somebody has to let you know to get up to about where mm -hmm. old Heidelberg is. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. the Wilson area. Yeah, if it fails, the water comes out, roars it down past Pacific Creek, will probably shoot up Buffalo Creek a little ways, and then turn and come down. I think it takes seven hours to get to uh, Moose. So it, it it's not going at rocket speed. <laughs> but uh, if, if, if you're in John Dodge and some of those places, probably need to get to high ground. Don, earlier you mentioned that these uh, magnitudes of shaking yeah. on the alluvial material, what, eight or nine or things like that, that's not the earthquake shaking. It's not equivalent to that. No, no. Okay, finish your thought. Are you, is that a question? That is a part of the question, it's, isn't it? I, I took it I, as... What does it mean? Okay, well, what it means is in earthquake shaking, an 8 is 100 times stronger than a 7, and a 9 is 100 times stronger than an 8. It's just the far part of vibration. And as I explained to people on, on the Richter scale, uh, when you get above 6, you probably can't stand. The ground is moving so much that you'll be tossed to the ground. I have no idea. You know, the only 8 we've ever had was in around uh, the U.S. was in Alaska, in Anchorage. And the whole downtown of Anchorage disappeared. It just dropped down and shot out into Cook Inlet. And uh, that was due to liquefaction. That's when they figured out what liquefaction was in that earthquake. Yes, same in San Francisco. Yeah, exactly. John, how many hours until it hit Wilson? Seven to Moose? Seven. And uh, they say about 12 hours 12. to Wilson. Yes. Doesn't it matter where the epicenter is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, epicenter that, in the middle of the dam is different than well, epicenter or anything. Well, it, it, more specifically, the, episode, the point of which the fault actually ruptured, and if it's on the Teton Fault, because remember the Teton Fault is dipping to the east. So as it dips, there, at some depth, it's literally underneath the dam. Mm -hmm. And depending on the motion, if it's if it's this way, it's, that's one thing. If it's up and down, well, then the whole dam is kind of going up and down. And people talk about having tidal waves going across the lake and things like that that could erode the earth and part, all kinds of good stuff. So if we have a really strong one, uh, go up and have a drink for a while. <laughs> well, that's no, that was uh, the volcano where he goes overdue. And on, on earthquakes, yes. The, uh, typically, if you, if you do the math, the Teton Fault, to get the relief they've got, you know, where he talked about 25,000 feet down, and well, yeah, that you've had to have a, a major seven plus earthquake about every 2,000 years, and it's been over 4,000 years since we've had a really big one. Yeah. How many years since? Don, why, why hasn't somebody gone and done a seismic survey across that in the area of the dam over to the, across the fault out there to find out what the, the dip right. of that fault is? Uh, it's called the National Park Service. To, to really do it well, you'd have to get kind of oil 
field equipment kind of, which would use a what we call a sleeve exploder, where it, it puts a pulse into the water, and I'm sure people would worry about you know damage to the fish and everything else under the sun. And the No, it's not that. You know, it, it, it wouldn't hurt the dam, but it, if you uh, you're putting a shock wave in. Yes. John, um, we know it would go to Wilson because the valley tips that way. What about South Park in that area? Would that that would be in danger too, wouldn't it? Yeah. And what about the season that this would happen? How, yeah, well, what are the considerations for wintertime? Well, the good news in the winter is usually the dam's a little lower. lower less water. That's yeah. the good news. The bad news is uh, basically any slope greater than two degrees will avalanche in a big earthquake. So forget the roads. Yeah, the roads will be closed. Can you say that again? <laughs> Any snow at a slope greater than two degrees will move in a big earthquake and start to avalanche. No, 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 don't. <laughs> Remember, it's been 4,000 years since we had a big one. <laughs> okay, here's a bunch of funky old guys. Sorry, John. <laughs> no, no, no. It was it really helped. Uh, these are the Burek uh, officials, uh, and the second from the left, the old fat guy, is Hugh McDermott, who we'll get to in a moment. What's, in what's his name? Hugh, Hugh McDermott. Hugh, Hugh McDermott. McDermott. Okay. Uh, in 1919, state engineer Frank Emerson proposed a dam at the outlet of Jenny Lake for irrigation. The pro 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 proposed dam would have raised the water level of Jenny Lake 20 feet and the level of Lee Lake by 10 feet. The Park Service employed the 1918 executive order to prevent construction of the dam. Thus, almost every lake draining into the south fork of the Snake River was at hazard for development at some time or another. And notice how many times Jenny Lake uh, is mentioned as a potential dam site. Mm -hmm. It's half a dozen times. But fortunately, whoever was in power <coughs> stuck to their guns and we don't have a dam on Jenny Lake, fortunately. The history of, of irrigation in Jackson Hole fits the pattern that occurred elsewhere in the American West. Individual partnerships and group efforts accounted for virtually all irrigation systems in Jackson Hole. Homesteaders constructed the ditches in what would become Grand Teton Park between 1896 and 1927, using hand, to hand tools and horse-drawn scrapers for the work. These systems were small scale. Even the largest ditches seldom exceeded 10, 10 appropriated users and most ditches were no more than three miles in length. So the efforts of local homesteaders to develop water resources in Jackson Hole came to nothing, although the original log and mud dam, was, which was built in 1905 by Valley Homesteaders, established their right to the, wa to the water. Having promoted the Minidoka project, the farmers of southeastern, uh, southeastern Idaho got all the water. There was a camp on the, uh, uh, on the shore of, of Moran Bay where a team uh, cut logs to be floated across the dam and then shipped southward to uh, uh, the sawmill in Phillips Canyon. Here's McDermott, a retired forest ranger who helped Frank Crow survey and lay out the route of the Reclamation Ashton Moran Road. He also piloted, piloted a tugboat on Jackson Lake to haul flotillas of logs from Moran Bay to Jackson Lake Dam. From there, they were freighted overland by wagon to the sawmill at Phillips Canyon, and the sawn lumber was then hauled back to the dam to build concrete forms. Why was the sawmill in Phillips Canyon? Why was it in Phillips Canyon? Because yeah. that's where somebody cited it. Uh, they did not have a sawmill at the dam. Uh, I guess they... They probably needed the, the water coming out of Phillips Canyon 
to turn the water mill to, to make the saw okay. sure be my guess. In 1976, the Bureau of Reclamation conducted studies on dams and determined that Jackson Lake Dam was susceptible to failure in case of an earthquake of magnitude 5.5 or greater. The dam was upgraded during the 1986 to 89 rebuild, and the Bureau of Reclamation believed it would withstand, quote, the maximum cred credible earthquake of magnitude 7.5. Since then, various studies have cast doubt on this belief. Here's, here's uh, uh, a parallel to, to John's remark about Ralph Akshaneda. He was a professor of seismology at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, liquefaction in which stable sub substances lose their structural integrity as water is shaken from them causes collapse of structures and foundations. I work now. Here's here's a. Uh, a personal observation of what this this mud does. I worked on construction of government housing at Coder Bay in the mid 1980s, where glacial dropstone conglomerate, which is thixotropic, was the predominant soil type. Thixotropic or non-Newtonian fluids uh, become leathery under stress. Uh, we call the the condition condition gel but flow easily when stress is removed, uh, the condition of salt. It was the damnedest stuff I have ever experienced. To dig it up, I had to jiggle the shovel to liquefy the leather-like dirt. Once on the shovel, it turned to salt and dribbled off the shovel. And when I would go to dump the shovel load, it became solid again, so I had to shake the shovel to get it off. And then it turned back into salt and flowed right back into the ditch. <laughs> Honestly, the, the craziest stuff I've ever experienced. It was enormously frustrating, and I went through about 25 laborers because they stayed two days and then they left. Couldn't do it. <laughs> the thing you have to realize is the whole Jackson Lake was carved out by a glacier, so it has this very fine glacial material in it, and then you've got water in the lake, and so the whole bottom, and uh, according to the Bureau of Rec, it's actually over 600 feet of this very fine-grained water-filled mud, if you will. They stabilized when they drilled these core holes and did the dropping. Mm -hmm. Those core holes, the deepest of those things they filled with the concrete mud was about 200 feet. So. Now that's probably more than deep enough in their mind to keep the, the lake from giving away. But I have no idea what that other 400 feet of liquid filled mud is mm -hmm. going to do in a strong earthquake. Uh, let me explain about a glacial dropstone conglomerate. As an iceberg floats along, uh, of course it's melting and it drops the gravel and, and rock held in it. And that's what makes the dropstone conglomerate. It's really weird stuff. Uh, some of the ash in Yellowstone is also thixotropic. Uh, you can hold it in your hand, and it dribbles off your hand. Uh, but if you squeeze it, it makes a solid mud ball. You're going to have to speak up. We've got a lawnmower going outside. <laughs> yeah. OK. You know, that's common in industry to uh, take a powder Yes, vibrating. Well, you can yes, you can make oobleck with uh, cornstarch and water. And you don't even have to use water. If you just vibrate it, all of a sudden oh, it starts flowing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's weird. This weird stuff. Yeah. Just try to speak really loud here for a minute. Mark, geologist Mark Zelman says the Teton Fault. Is significant because it is one of the Can't fastest hear. moving Hang on. Can you hear me? No. no. Shall I just wait a second?
Geologist Mark Analsha. Geologist Mark Zellman says the Teton Fault is significant because it is one of the fastest moving faults in the interior western United States. The fault has offset young quaternary glacial sediments, revealing its movement in the recent geologic past and the potential for moder modern seismic activity. Although the fault has not moved for thousands of years, prominent scarps and evidence I'm glad we're being recorded. She had fire in her eyes. Okay. Although the fault has not moved for thousands of years, prominent scarps and evidence from young faulting observed in trenches, such as the one that Bob Smith dug uh, and showed last night, uh, and evidence from uh, that show the fault has moved during multiple large earthquakes since glacial retreat about 14,000 years ago as documented by measuring the change in elevation from the Cambrian Age sandstone at the top of Mount Moran to the depth of that same rock in the subsurface of Jackson Hole. This fault has, accom has accommodated more than 30,000 feet of uplift. Okay, here are some BUREC officials on going over uh, Teton Pass. By their dress and maturity, they appear to be Bureau of Reclamation officials, engineers, paymasters, foremen, and perhaps the dam superintendent. Teton County Commissioner Bill Paddleford said it was his understanding that Archuleta was hired by Burek to conduct the dam safety. They've been withholding the dam safety study, the hazards report, from us for a number of years under the aegis of national security, Paddleford said. If what I hear was correct, we are totally justified in asking for the study. Bureau of Reclamation officials have maintained that the dam is safe, even though they acknowledge it would be damaged in a quake. There is significant scientific evidence that the sediments beneath Jackson Lake Dam are likely to liquefy like quicksand in a, in a seismic event of magnitude seven. Liquid, liquefaction of the sediments is likely to cause the dam to fail. I want to note that both the Bureau of Reclamation and the National Park Service are under the Department of Interior, but they don't talk to each other. <laughs> the Reclamation determined that the dam and its foundation would be susceptible to liquefaction and failure during a potential earthquake. A series of contracts was let to strengthen the dam with compacted fill and to improve the dam's foundation to depths of up, up to my number is 110 feet. You said 200. Yeah. A couple of the boreholes went yeah. down about 200 uh, feet. Now, remember that the muck is over, over 600 feet deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. After considering a number of options, the Burek selected deep soil mixing as a method to improve the subsoils and to install an upstream cutoff wall. which appears to have great promise as a method of creating deep foundations, containing walls, improve the soil, and even uh, stabilize underwater foundations. Jackson Lake Dam played a part, albeit indirectly, in generating opposition to other reclamation projects in Jackson Hole and Yellowstone. In particular, a significant number of Valley resident, residents opposed a plan put forth by Frank Emerson, state engineer and later governor of Wyoming, to construct a dam at the outlet of Jenny Lake. See, there we are again. Opponents used the dam, uh, used Jackson Lake's fate as an object lesson in spoiled mountain scenery. The Reclamation Service failed to cut and clear thousands of lodgepole pine trees that were killed by the rising waters. The result is an unsightly tangle of dead trees around the shore of the lake. And the CCC 
cleaned up 8,000 acres of shoreline in the 1930s. Although some trees were cut, many of those stumps remain along the shoreline of Jackson Lake. On gravel beach, stumps hunker like crabs on wave lap roots to keep their belly dry. Based on the date of, the, of their appropriation, farmers in Idaho own the water in Jackson Lake Dam, and the Snake River provides a convenient canal to, de de to deliver that water directly to Idaho and onward downstream, a total of 800 miles to the mouth of the Columbia River at Astoria, Oregon. But the basic reason for that is not water, but geology. The Snake River flows generally south through Jackson Hole, and then turns westward at Elbow Campground and cuts directly through the salt of the Snake River Range. Like many rivers in Wyoming, the Snake is an antecedent river. The course of the river predates the uplift of the Snake and Salt River Range, whose uplift was slow enough that the river could maintain its course by downcutting rapidly enough to keep pace with the uplift of the mountains. After two decades of political debates, a compromise between local irrigators and conservationists in Congress allowed for the creation of two dams, both added to the Minidoka project. The Grassy Lake Dam was built at the head of Cascade Creek near Fall River and close to the southern edge of Yellowstone. It was an earth-filled dam begun in 1937 and completed in 1939. The construction of this, it was a trade-off. Construction of, the, of, of Grassy Lake Dam would prevent Yellowstone Lake from being diverted for irrigation. Yellowstone for, Lake? Yeah. Yellowstone <laughs> Lake, yes. Holy fright. Yeah, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the supplement of water from Grassy Lake allowed the flow uh, to farmers in southeast Idaho to continue, especially during the seasons of drought. Okay, we're going to go a little faster here. Everyone agrees that the Snake River fishery isn't what it used to be. Early decline was blamed on Jackson Lake Dam, which blocked spawning habitat, and the decline since then has been blamed on irrigation diversions and siltation, low flows from the dam, and levees downstream from the park. The critical problem is that during winter weather, water is held back by Jackson Lake Dam for next summer's irrigation season. In the low water year of 1977, 43% of the beavers in the park died because of depleted water flows. In the dry year of 1987, the Bureau Rec cut water releases to 100 CFS, and with low flows repeated in 1988, Trout populations were hit by, were down by 71%, with the larger trout being hit the hardest. Wyoming Game and Fish recommends 280 CFS below the dam and an optimum of 400 CFS. Invertebrates are lost when the river drops below 280 CFS, which is devastating to the sculpin population, which is food for the trouts. Coal was mined just east of the park boundary near the junction of US 287 and the Buffalo Valley Road. So I drive by this every day. This subbituminous sub deposits are part of the Bacon Ridge and Pinyon formations. The Pinyon, Bacon Ridge is Upper Cretaceous and the Pinyon is Paleocene and Eocene. In winter, this fuel was essential for melting ice or snow to make concrete and to prevent the pour, poured concrete from freezing. When I came to the valley in the late 1960s, the tipples were still partially standing, but now they were all mashed flat by snow. The drought of 1992, which threatened 1.2 million acres of irrigated Idaho agriculture, was in such dire need of water that the region planned to use its entire water allotment from 
Jackson Lake by October 1st. Reservoir levels dropped 32 feet, so low that Colder Bay Marina on Jackson Lake was closed to the use of boaters, while Signal Mountain and Leakes Marina were less affected. Idaho irrigators do not own the water. What did the Headwaters State get in return for giving away 98% of its largest river? Nothing that is apparent. Aside from its history, Jackson Lake Dam is unique. You can see all the mechanics. There is no machinery or mechanical room. <coughs> As one walks on the road across Jackson, Jackson Lake Dam, you will see 15 metal gates each individually raised and lowered by a gate stem to, in, to release water as the agency's water operations managers dictate. Improvements to the dam included replacement of the or original machinery to lift the outlet gates with electric equipment. The gate stems are like giant screws that come up to the dam's deck. They are covered with simple plastic caps. You take the cap off and an electric motor spins the stem up. The 1,500 foot long levee extends, to the, extends north of the dam to form the right flank of Jackson Lake Dam. The north levee has now been extended to a 4,580 foot long embankment section and a 150 foot long left or south dike uh, embankment extension. In, uh, in either case, Jackson Lake Dam could be affected by both a seismic event on Teton Fault and a resultant siege in which the levee of the North Dam to the north of the dam, which is 19 and a half feet higher than the water level of Jackson Lake Reservoir at full pool, would be overtopped. The plain of, of the Teton Fault is poorly defined, but generally dips eastward at angles of 35, 45 to 60 degrees. So the epicenter of, uh, epicenter of the quake would be beneath Jackson Lake Dam. Nevertheless, the Safety of Dams Committee final report considered the dam could withstand the maximum credible earthquake of magnitude 7.5. Failure of dams due to overtopping is a common failure mode accounting for 30% of the failures in the U.S. over the last 75 years. Many older dams have, were designed for floods that no longer represent a possible flood event. Many dams cannot pass the current probable minute maximum flow without overtopping. Here we go. Okay, this is a sinch. Uh, you see the black uh, line is the standing wave of the sage uh, with two propagating waves, red and blue, traveling in opposite directions. As the wave moves from deep to shallow water, the front surface of the wave gradually get, becomes steeper than the back surface. When the water, water depth is less than 1 20th the wavelength, the wave becomes a shallow water wave and uh, so destruction is considerable. So here's the washout. This was the following uh, slide. So yeah, that slide was the Teton Dam yeah. right over yonder. So here's the completed and operating Grand Jackson Lake Dam with Mount Moran in the background. So any questions? <laughs> Go over the pass and up through uh, Victor and go to towards Rigby, you'll actually see a little sign that says uh, Teton Dam site. And you go up there and you still see the chunks of concrete. It was a it was a dam that was built at way after Jackson Dam. And they built it in some pretty incompetent rock. And when it failed is when they had to come back and reevaluate all the other dams. Failed in the 70s, and that's why in the 80s they they tried to stabilize this dam. Mm -hmm.
I was here when Teton Dam burst. It was an earth-filled dam, and there was a leaky spot in the dam. So here's this D9 cat pushing dirt into the hole, and down went the tractor yeah. into the hole, and then the whole dam let go. Uh, and there was a, a, uh, a number of cows and a lot of rubble perched up 20 feet in the trees where, from where the dam had washed them. Yes? Was anybody killed in the construction of this dam? Uh, I don't have any information on that. It might be. And the other question is, with as much water as at least the eastern part of the country is getting now, are those dams that you just said were not in danger of being overtopped going to be overtopped? I suspect that they are all susceptible because they were built before uh, anyone imagined that, that large floods, would, large earth floods would occur, well, as is happening right now. An, an example of that, um, right above New Orleans on the Lake Pontchartrain, there's this huge spillway called the Bonacary Spillway that was built with the idea that if Mississippi is running at a high state, they'll open it for a week or two or so and uh, get the water level down by just dropping it into the Lake Pontchartrain. This year, the Bonacary Spillway has been open since May and continuously flowing in the Lake Pontchartrain. And that's why you may have heard about the big um, uh, algae bloom that has caused a whole bunch of people not to be able to go into the water in Mississippi and mm -hmm. down there. It's because of all the fresh water that's getting dumped mm -hmm. into the Pontchartrain, which then flows into the ocean and, and goes the current takes it to the east. And the algae like the fresh water? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'd like to add something more about the Burek. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the dams, especially the big dams in the United States, were built uh, 1945 to about 1965. Now, large canyons carry large quantities of water, which carries large quantities of sediment. Mm -hmm. Small dams or small rivers are in smaller canyons with a smaller quantity of sediment. But a, the proportion of sediment to water is approximately the same. All these dams were built in a 40-year period, which means they're all going to sediment up at the same time. <laughs> Happy days. And all of the good, good dam sites worldwide have already been built on. But don't, can't they flush the sediment out? Don't no. they have gates on the bottom now? No, the, 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 most of the dams, like Hoover Dam, the answer is no. Uh, the dam, the Three Gorges Dam that they just finished building actually has one of the first systems to try to flush the sediment out. Yes, one does. Okay, the, under, so. under, the untold story is that Glen Canyon Dam was built to trap the sediment so that Boulder Dam or Hoover Dam would last longer. And right now in Lake Powell, sediment is building up at four inches a year. When that sediment reaches the bottom of the intake tubes for the generators, that's the end of hydropower. So I'd like to point out that hydropower is not renewable. <laughs> Another thing that could happen is what happened on Palisades Dam a long time ago when they were trying to draw down the reservoir and they were trying not to flush sediment, but by mistake they drew it down too far, flushed a bunch of sediment, and had massive fish kill downstream in the Henry's Fork. The eagles were happy, the bears were happy. But yeah. It was, it was fishermen were not happy. So. <laughs> well, any other questions or comments? I think, uh, John, a great job. It was quite interesting.